answer a question like that? What would be your tools and what method would you take? Yeah, I think like if you believe there's a creator, you have to aim across uh, any, so, any sort of like proof that, that it exists. Like maybe it's any sort of like, I don't know, like proof to yourself. Like I think it's like in that sense, it's very personal. Someone, uh, I think someone will take something very small as a proof, uh, as a very good proof. And there's people that that need like something really material, and some some people just maybe mm. something more more small, or maybe a, a small act in his life is proof enough that something exists. Or that it does something. So what about yourself? Are you open to proof and evidence to formulate your ideology or yeah, belief? Yeah, if, if I came at, if in, because inside I don't I don't have a, a, any evidence that it doesn't exist. As I, as I tell you, as I told you. So if at any point in my life I came across any sort of something that I take as evidence that something exists or something doesn't, maybe I will take that point of view. Yeah. I'm not mm. like, so what kind difficult. of what kind of evidence are you open to? Uh, maybe something that happens in my life, something that I see, something that I, don't, I think in, something. Um, I don't think it's something very concrete, you know, like something very. It's, it's more open. I, I, yeah, think, yeah. I believe. I, but what, what types of evidence are you open to? Because evidence I, what, comes what in. What do you mean exactly? Like? Evidence comes in various types. To give you an example of, say, I don't believe there are triangular circles in our world. Like what? In our, Sorry. A triangular circle or a squared circle. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Um, I don't have to go to any lab to demonstrate that and prove it yeah. without doing any experiments, yeah. so without replicating any experiments, uh, I can be certain that they don't exist in our universe. Yeah. How is that? Like, I, 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 like, I know it's not true, but... Yeah, so do I need to experiment that to, no, to know that it's not, it's no, not, it's, it's not possible? Right. You cannot, right? Yeah, so there are things that we can be certain of, yeah. even without empirical observations and experimentations yeah. and replicability. Okay, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So th these are rational proofs. Yeah. So there are things that we need to be open to, to understand. So when we talk about God yeah. or the Creator, is God something or someone that can be answered by empiricism? Is that the right tool to answer this question? Uh, Sometimes we may need to have the right tool yeah. To get the right answer. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, no, like, no. yeah. Like, I, because if, if, if God is beyond space and time, yeah, that's true. and you're using tools which are constrained within space and time, yeah. that would not be really the right tool to use to answer that question. Yeah, that's true. So that's why we will say God, the question of God's existence is beyond this particular framework or methodology of, of yeah. knowledge. So science is not in a position to answer the question because of the limitations of its methodology. Oh, yeah. Science deals with the, the world, the physical world. We don't deal with spirituality and metaphysics. Okay? So you can't answer a question which is beyond this world, right? We say the believers, like I'm a Muslim, I believe in God. We say God is the one who created this world, yeah. so he's not bound or limited or constrained within this world. Yeah. So you can't use the scientific method to answer that question whether God exists or not. And you have to use something you, else. And what would you use? Like, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You have to use something else, like yeah. rational evidence, yeah, for, for example. Rational and evidence. Your, and just in your case, for example. Or, right, yeah, yeah, rational evidence can be yeah. one of the evidence in which we can. So that's why I asked you, what do you consider is this world has always been there or not? Yeah. Because that can help us to understand this question better. Yeah. Because the either the world was always there or it wasn't always there. It's a binary question. Yeah, yeah. And you can explore each alternative and see which one gives us an answer which makes sense, rational sense, coherent sense, yeah. so we can adopt as an ideology. So if the world wasn't always there, yeah then we have to answer this question. When something like this world wasn't always there, how did it come to be? Because when it wasn't there, it was nothing to begin with, how does something arise from nothingness? It cannot, because nothingness is absence of anything. Absence of energy, absence of time, absence of space, absence of anything that you can imagine. That's nothingness. So if our world 
in the past, in inverted quotes, was nothingness to begin with at one point, then there will always be nothingness. So that option is not an option which is meaningful and coherent. We cannot accept that. It doesn't make sense. So the world has to be always there or something has to be always there. So this world demonstrates to us that it's actually quite contingent, limited and dependent on everything and everything that we see. Everything that you see, you are dependent on water and air and food. Anything else that you see, likewise, it's dependent, contingent on, right? The set of dependent things, the whole set, is going to be dependent. We cannot have a dependent thing existing by itself when it needs to rely on something that is not dependent, independent. So our world, looking at our world, needs to be dependent on or contingent on something that is independent, something that is absolute something that is not limited yeah, yeah? I mean, your case, and in our case yeah. that is what we say is the originator of our universe yeah. okay. now this originator you can ask this question what is the nature of this originator is that contingent dependent or is it not it will have, same questions again it has to eventually be an originator or a creator that is not dependent eventually you have to come to a point so there will be a point where you will have to come to a point of something that exists that is not dependent on, that is not dependent on anything yeah. and that it exists always yeah. without being non-existent at some point of time but it was always there. Yeah. That is what we're referring to as the creator. Yeah. And if you think about it, what's your name? Uh, Sergio. 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 Yeah. I'm Mansur. Uh, Sergio. Nice to, nice to meet you. Sergio. That thing that exists always without being dependent has to exist with certain qualities and attributes because it didn't acquire them from anyone. It always had it because it was always there. One of those attributes you can deduce right from here. It must be possessor of energy because without energy you can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. It has to be possessor of energy or power or might. There's another thing. It must be existent. Like, it is real. Okay, it exists. Okay, okay, well, okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are qualities of things, maybe, you know, something I said, for example, zero. Yeah. Does it really exist? It's, no. a it's, a it's a concept. But it has no real existence. Yeah. We use this to conceptualize our mathematics and so on and so forth. But when we talk about God, it's not an abstract concept. It's a real existence. So, ah, so the video that I have done, it was, it will be in two channels. Write it down. Sam Dawa. And you spoke to my friend later, Dawa Wise. So I, no, I'll, I'll show you which one on the internet. If you, if you excuse me for a second, I just want to show you. Yeah. So, so one of them is. So this one here, Sam Dawa. Okay, that, and, and then, and then the other one, also it will be uploaded in this channel called Dawa Wise. This one here, Dawa Wise. What means Dawa? Dawa means to invite people to the truth. Wise, of course, is being wise. So you do that wisely. So, Julia and Emanuela, it was a pleasure speaking to you. So, hopefully, if you come again, we can continue our conversation. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Sergio? Yeah. Sergio. So, we can come to the conclusion about certain properties or attributes of this being. Existence, possessor of power. I would also add self-awareness. Consciousness or self-awareness? Because if something is not self-aware and not conscious, how is it going to do anything with this power? Nothing will happen. On top of that, I would also add, it will be a possessor of something that has a will, a choice. So, willed this universe to come into existence in this way, rather than in other way. Because our universe could have been a different way. Like, we, we could have been human beings with wings, for example. We could have, right? So, the way we are created in this way is because of a choice, because of a will of this being. So, if you have a 
an existent reality who is self-aware, powerful, independent, I would also say must be self-sufficient. Self-sufficient, independent, has to be one. Cannot be met. There cannot be more than one of those things. It doesn't. Why is that like? Uh, how do we arrive at that? Yeah. Isn't it? How do we arrive that there can only be one of those things? If you think about it, if you had more than one of these things, what do we expect? For the sake of argument, let's take two of those creators who are self-aware, absolute. Yeah. They are self-sufficient. They have. Power without any bounds, without any limitations. If that was the case, imagine now one of them wants to create something. He wants to create a world replacing this world. Should be able to do that, right? That's all powerful. But if the other one says he wants to keep that world as it is, what's going to happen? There's a conflict of will. Conflict of will. You can't have both. Either another world gets created, in that way, the, the God, the creator which wanted it to happen like this, is powerful. But the other one is not all powerful, failed to maintain it. And if the other one maintains this world, and the first one is not able to create another world replacing this one, then the first one is not all powerful. You can only have one. It's like, I can give you a, a simple scenario. Yeah. Do you know how to drive? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Right. When you learned, you had an instructor sitting on the other side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the cars have two different sort of steering wheels and clutch, gas, brakes and stuff. Yeah. If you have a car with independent controls, mm-hmm. left and right, two drivers who are independent of each other. One of them wants to take the car to the south and the other one wants to take the car to the north. Yeah. Where's the car going to go? It keeps still, I guess. Do you see the problem? Yeah, yeah. You cannot have two absolute sovereign wills happen at the same time because of the conflict of will. So our universe, the Quran actually says that. Had there been more than one gods, there will be corruption and chaos in this world. If there was two creators, one says, now I want rain. Other one says, no, I want sunshine. There will be chaos and corruption. But look at our world, organized. Control of one. There seems to be one originator control in this world. That's the reality. Otherwise, the earth will be split from its orbit and go somewhere else. We don't see that. We see in a very finely tuned universe. Yeah. So polytheism of the belief in more than one creator is actually not a rational concept. Critically thinking people know that. But they just have to accept it. Sometimes people are bound by the traditions and they just believe in it by blind faith. But we as critical thinkers, we have to really you know, say no, the truth has to be understood in that sense. Um, we can't just use our gut feelings of our traditions. The Quran reprimands those who say, oh, I'm going to believe what my forefathers believe, what my parents believe, and what my ancestors believe. And the Quran says, even if they were wrong, are you going to carry on believing them? Because they could be wrong. So we should not just keep on for the sake of believing our parents and our forefathers what they believed. We have to believe in the truth. And the Quran offers us the, the criteria of knowing this with truth and sincerity. So, what we've discussed, um, remind me of your name again, Sergio? Sergio. Sergio. Yeah. We talked about our universe must be dependent on someone or something that is independent, absolute. In philosophical term, they call it being a say, having the property of a society, self-sufficient. Yeah. Okay? They also talk about this being is a necessary being. So our universe must be reliant on this necessary being because that being has necessarily has to exist. And we know that. Yeah. There has to be something that necessarily exists. In certain traditions, it's called Wahdatul Ujud or the necessary existence. Same thing. The, the creator is a necessary existence who has created all of these things. Has to be one. Now, I want to show you something. And I want to hear your reaction. Something that I'm going to four lines of a text. Okay, this text is from a religious scripture. Okay, oh, of course, this will be in English, but I want you to just give me your reflection on this. Which one is it? Just read the English. Uh, which one? The first one? Yeah. Oh. Say, yeah. oh Muhammad's prophet, he is Allah one. 
he is the self sufficient master whom all creators need need and he yeah, is yeah. basically everything there's a word samad means everything depends on him he doesn't depend on anything else yeah. he doesn't he beget no. nor is he begotten he doesn't produce children nor that he is born himself yeah. there's okay. no co-equal or comparable to him. with him yeah. okay. do you see this concept the concept of just what we talked about yeah yeah it's one yeah. only unique absolute independent self sufficient yeah. the one who's not born the one who doesn't give birth because there will not be one anymore there will be more than one and there's nothing like unto this because anything with this property there will be nothing like unto that this is the quran chapter 112 called chapter yeah. of purity describing who our creator is the creator is telling the prophet the messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam tell them say Qul huwa Allahu ahad Say he is Allah The one The, one, yeah. the only, the unique Does that resonate with you? Does that make yeah, sense? I mean, yeah, it makes sense but From my point of view, like I, I just find like very hard to believe Like for myself like, yeah. That there is something like That it's not dependent on something like, It just was there I agree, it's like, very it's very difficult for us to accept it yeah. That's why Islam means in a way, submission and surrender of one's will. Yeah. Because you might not realize that you are here. Some people say, I don't exist. Yeah. And they say, no, no, I am the king. People have this kind of lots of um, cognitive dissonance and so on. They, they, they can't accept the reality for what it is. If I know that I am going to die, it's no point fighting it. They're, oh, no, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live forever. There are some people who want to. No, I'm going to live forever. No one can take me, make me die. I'm going to put myself in a, in a vault and, and nothing will take me. I'm, I'm going to have all this antibacterial prophylaxis, antiviral, antifungal, and microbial. I'm not going to die. But the reality is, Sergio, we are programmed to die in, our, in ourselves. Yeah? So we have to somehow submit to this fact once you realize you are a contingent being in this contingent universe, there is a necessary being which always exists. You know, why not me, that necessary being, you might ask. But the reality is you're not that. And we have to accept that reality. And this is the submission and surrender of, of, the, of the facts of reality and saying, okay, now I understand I, I am what I am. And I, I happen not to be the king. I happen not to be the, the, the prime minister or not to be the, the creator of the universe. That is something that you make this internal submission. Once you do that, I know it's difficult because our ego is such that we don't want to. Many atheists, the reason they are atheists is because of this exactly as you said. It's submitting their ego to someone greater than them. They want to. They, they can't accept someone who's greater than okay, them. It's not something like in the case. It's not something like I, I, I like that's that's one one thing. But it just like I just find like really hard to like think like there's a being like that is completely independent. Not the fact that I'm not that one. Fine. Just the fact that yeah, that being exists. I accept and I agree. Yeah. This is the case. It's just because we having these qualities, we wish yeah. that you know everyone, everything was like us in, in our limitations you know, subconsciously. Yeah. Because how can they be something that is independent? Yeah. I mean, how can they be? But we have to acknowledge that there has to be that case eventually, because that is the reality of existence. The fact that, you know, I'm not a brain in a jar, that I'm alive and I'm going to die. We, we, we constantly submit to these realities. We don't like it, maybe, but we submit to these realities. And this is the submission that will free you from the enslavement everything else that you know make you think and you know be in confusion and so on because once you are really free it's only when you make that submission you will be freely thinking you you know you, you'll not be bound by people's um you know constraints and restrictions and so on you will say no why should i be race, racist for example your whole idea will disappear like the one who created me and you we cannot have a distinction because he created you and he created me same you know if i need blood I can get blood from someone who's the same blood type, whether you're a black person or a white person, doesn't matter, right? So whole idea of racism will disappear. The, the, the concept of empathy and sympathy will come in. The, comp the concept of uh, the greed should disappear because why am I going to be greedy? You, we're in the same human family where we should look after each other because we are the same creation of our creator. So that belief will actually free us from the enslavement, from the societal concepts in which there is this greed, um, the idea of 
exploitation and so on and so forth. You know how people try to exploit others because of that? Because they're rich, because they're famous and so on? All of that will disappear. Then you will see equality in people's eyes. Like, you're no different than I. Islam makes that belief practical so that they can live with it rather than have a concept, you know, that's you know, an idea. Do you know what we do when we pray? We stand together in prayer side by side. He could be the, the king of Mauritania, for example, and I could be the street cleaner. I can still be side by side with no differences whatsoever. Whether he's rich or poor doesn't matter. This is in prayer. That shows the human beings are all equal in the sight of God. When we go to Mecca to make our pilgrimage, your Hajj, that recently been, right, a few yeah. months ago, we wear men two pieces of clothes without any sewing. Two pieces of clothes, yeah. mainly they're white. Whether you're rich or poor, famous or infamous, all the same. Yeah. And you go there, circumambulate the Kaaba, doing the worship of God, or you stand yeah. in, in, in prayer, yeah. the same. No difference between who you are and what you are. Whether you like, you know. Sometimes the only times you see is when people are the monarchs or kings and so on, they have some extra protection elsewhere because of the political situations. Yeah. But if that wasn't the case, <laughs> they will be like everyone else. He will be like following. In fact, you'll be surprised to sometimes see a street cleaner is leading the prayer for hundreds of thousands of people, right? No distinction between him and the others, even though they could be the richest of the rich. Islam makes that through the submission to one true God. That is the benefit of knowing that reality, even though you might you, you find uh, difficulty. But this is a good thing. Yeah. Knowing that is a good thing because once you truly submit, your submission will be of all sincerity. Genuine submission to God. It's not doing it for the sake of doing it, to show off someone, because the Quran actually reprimands people who show off when they're praying. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ those who show off people or they were neglecting of their prayers. Woe to those who pray. Yeah. You'll be surprised. Why would God, you know, put in people down who pray? But he's doing that to people who are showing off or doing you know, things like that. So when you submit to God with all this sincerity, yeah. with, with this genuine, you know, real realization, that connection that you will have with God, yeah. it will be such a strong connection. Then your outlook of life will change. You will no longer feel like, you know, when you see someone in the streets and they need help, you would not say, ah, oh, I am German and this is, you know, um, say, another country from someone else. You would not have this kind of mentality. You know how people, when they hear some accidents happen, say a plane got burst on the, in the air, a lot of people died, and they read the people and say, oh, thank God, there were no English in there. But what about the people who died? Would you not be, you know, heartful of them? It's human beings, but there are many people who are subconsciously racist. They don't even realize that yeah. or nationalists in that sense. They say, oh, thank God there were no Germans in the plane. But what about the people who die? Islam reformulates your thinking and says, no, you think you are the creature of God or a worshiper of God. You either worship him or you don't. That's the true broad categories. So whether you are submitting to God or you don't, the one who don't, you know, you're always going to engage with each other and say, look, look, you are still, but you don't put them down and so on because they don't believe. No, you still have to maintain the status quo and say, fine, you can still live as with this belief system. So, as you realize, Sir, you're believing in a creator yeah. who is a necessary being who created us. The next question is to ask, why? Why are we created? The creator could have simply not created us. Yeah, that's true. The fact that he created us, there must be a purpose. There must be a purpose. When we draw paintings, pictures, we just don't simply take brushes and draw it we do this for a purpose we we have something within us we want to show we want to express express something the creator is expressing his creativity his creative act saying how he is by his creation that we can now appreciate him what he is yeah so our appreciation is one thing shouldn't we appreciate for what he is well how majestic the creator is now if we have been created with all of these things like for example you and me you know, I have two kidneys. I'm not sure how many you have. Two? Two. two kidneys, right. You have one heart. Yeah. You have lungs too. Yeah. Um, many parts of your organs, you didn't ask for anyone, but it was given to you. Yeah, and they fulfill a purpose to make you live in a way that is living. 
So your hearts will beam, lab dab, it will beat, lab dab, lab dab, lab dab, lab dab, pump the blood all around the body. You're not controlling it. Are you saying, oh, heart, pump my blood. When you go to sleep, do you do that? You don't. There's an autonomic nervous system, part of our brain, that, that controls that, which is already programmed within ourselves. So our hearts beating, our lungs are taking in the air, the oxygen and filtering out carbon dioxide and so on. All of that, when you are asleep, you don't constantly do that. I'm going to take in breathe. I'm going to take breathe out, breathe in. You don't do that. So many of the things that you have, shouldn't you be thankful for someone who gave you all this? Not only this, the machine is there. So is the thing that is required for that machine. The air is there. The food is there. The water is there. I should be thankful for all of this. So this thankfulness is something that is natural. It's not something that I need to be forced to give it. If, for example, I was involved in an accident and you helped me, saved me, and you know, I came to realize that you have done all this, you not only did, you know, gave me blood and a kidney, and you paid all the medical expenses, now, am I going to just simply say, okay, get lost? My natural response would be, thank you for what you've done. Gratitude, being grateful to you. It's a natural thing to do. It's, 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 it's showing that, yes, this is my the natural response to your kindness. When the Creator gave us all of this, out of His generosity, out of His mercy and kindness and His bounties, we should be thankful, grateful. So Islam says the essence of worship is that gratitude, that we are grateful to our Creator. So when we are grateful to our Creator, showing that gratefulness or thankfulness, being thankful, that is what we call worshipping God and we call that being, that entity, that reality, God. God simply is a being that deserves all our veneration, all our love and reverence, you know, fully, completely, okay? That is what's due and we call that worship. So when we look at our Creator and our creation, it is only natural to worship God. In fact, whether you like it or not, people are worshipping something or other. Those who believe in God or those who don't. There's something, they're venerating something, they're, they're revering something. The idea of this reverence is inbuilt within us. So that people don't somehow say, oh, I didn't know that I'm supposed to be thankful to you. Right? It's within, inbuilt. So people are either worshipping God or they're worshipping the pop stars. You know, here in Hyde Park, yeah. there are lots of many gigs and music things happen. And they're showing all their love and their reverence and everything to those, you know, musicians and pop stars and so on. Or you, you give your reverence to your football star or, or a wrestler or a boxer. This is what people do. They channel it somewhere else because they have it. Without this, people will be really, really confused in what to do because it's there. How do you channel this energy? The energy, this feeling of reverence and respect and love and honor and it's all there. So what Islam says simply is direct it to where it where it's due, and that is due to God. That's why we say in Islam, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and gratitudes belongs to God. It's due to God, because He's the one who is worthy of all of that. Nothing else is worthy. So, Sergio, is it difficult for us to even rationally come to this conclusion that there is a creator of our universe and our creator created for our purpose and that purpose must be to thank him, glorify him, to be grateful to him, to worship him and live our life according to what you want? It's not difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all of that I'm saying is, this is what Islam is all about. Islam is not asking you to suddenly leave all your everything and then you just become like a, a, a what's called a, a monk or something and go there and abandon your life. No, you live your life, but fulfilling that purpose and fulfilling that purpose within a boundary. So the boundary tells you that yes, you should not um, overstep on someone else's rights, the rights that God gives. God gives the rights that he has the right of his life, of his dignity, of his honor, of his family, yeah. friends, of his money, wealth and so on. So you should not kill him, you should not steal from him, you should not insult him and mock him, all of that. That's the boundary that Islam provides. That is not something that is um, unusual. It's something that you can understand that yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when someone is a Muslim, yeah. all they're doing is submitting to God in this way. So. Why would you not be a Muslim? Is my next question I will I'll be asking. What will be stopping you from a Muslim? Things you should be asking then, why am I not a Muslim? What are my obstacles? Because that seems to be the most sensible thing to do. Yeah. Oh, uh, 
I know, like, for, for example, like, why would I not, why would not I be, like, for example, a Catholic, uh, believing in, like... Very good. Religion? Why Islam in relation to other yeah. religions? So now we talk about religions at large. So what we can do again, we can have some kind of criteria to assess the validity of religions, because all of them cannot be true. Why? Because some of them contradict each other. If something contradicts each other, say something about God, that one says God have a son, another one says God doesn't have a son. If you say God has a son, you're going to go to hell. They cannot be both be true. So to understand the authenticity and validity of religions, we have to make up the first criteria is which religions can we assess or should we assess? Monotheistic or polytheistic? Polytheistic, we can set aside cannot be right because we already talked about it yeah, yeah. rationally polytheistic belief system cannot be true because we know that this is someone people made up because of they they may have struggled to think oh god is so good so why is there evil there it must be a god of evil so they start ascribing another god god of evil yeah this we know it's not real it's not it's not the reality of things monotheistic religions how many are they not many so you can start scrutinizing assessing and then verifying each one so you need to have some criteria. I would say, look, to examine religious scriptures or religious belief teachings, firstly, we have to do that with our sincerity and removing as much bias as possible to ascertain the truth. That means if I was a Muslim, I have to set aside my Muslim bias and say, I have to step aside this bias as much as I can. The, the problem is we can't set aside all the biases, yeah? Bias, something cannot be removed, something can. We need, we need to know that, this is, this is the limitation that we have. So we try as much as we can, set aside, and we say, look, so what are we seeing? Do we believe just because Tom, Dick and Harry says so, or there is a foundation of this belief? So we look at the foundation of the belief, usually the foundation of the beliefs are scripture, or the tradition, or both. So when you look at the scripture being the fir first and the most important and the primary foundation of the belief, we have to ask, what are the criteria are we going to use to assess the authenticity and validity of the scripture? Okay? Okay. If it's from God, it must behave like that. It must demonstrate that it's from God. It must give us the content within it, which demonstrate it comes from God. Whether it's from the knowledge of God or you know, the message reflects God's character. Yeah. If it says, you know what, God was a rat and he came down and people squashed it and that's it. You'd say it doesn't make any sense. So whatever it describes about God must make sense, coherent sense. The teaching it gives, it also has to make some sense. It cannot say, you know what, the white people are the devil, so kill them all. Or the black people are the devil, kill them all. You know, you know that this is inherent racism. This cannot be from God, one who created man, black or white. So the message content has to be examined in this light. So far, we, we are on the same page? Right. So when we look at this, we also have to ask, when were this message or the scripture given and given to who? How long ago? If it was given a long time ago, do we have that original message and transmitted it without any adultery and corruption and tampering? Because if it's changed, how do you know what it says about what it says about God or anything? Because people may have changed it already, right? So we need to have some idea of preservation and transmission of this text. So let's take the example of the Bible, as you mentioned, Catholic yeah. religion. So when we examine, we have to have some idea of certainty that it's been transmitted to us without any change. When we look at the transmission history of the Bible, what do we see? We see various manuscripts of this Bible that is now available to us, whether it's in the museums or libraries. British Library has quite an old one, about 400 years old or so, called Codex Sinaiticus. It houses in British Library. When you look at this manuscript and you check the current Bible, you will see some differences. The differences arose, uh, 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 arisen because of the current translation of the Bible, whether it's King James or others, they did not take into account these earlier manuscripts when it wasn't found and later manuscripts were different. So if you consider the Alexandrian tradition of the Bible manuscripts or the Byzantine traditions of the manuscripts, you will see there are differences. You will see even the Gospels, the Gospel accounts, right? Manuscripts tells you one thing, 
and later manuscript tells you another thing. So what happened then? The author did not write the same gospel in so many different ways. To give you an example, the gospel of Mark is a well-known gospel in which the ending has several endings in the manuscript tradition. It either ends in verse 8 or in verse 20, or it has an ending which is so long, like Codex Washingtoniensis is a 5th century manuscript of this gospel, which has an extra long ending. Extra long. Codex Sinaiticus has a shorter ending. Vaticanus has a shorter ending. So if you look at many manuscripts, shorter ending, which is like no ending at all, or a long ending, six, verse 8 to 16 or 16 to 20, or goes like this, or various long endings. If the author, say his name is Mark, right? Because he's called the Gospel of Mark. Let's call him, it's Mark's Gospel. He's the author. He didn't write all the different endings. He wrote one of them. The other ones will be something what we say, corrupted text either by adding, omitting, or altering. These are the three ways you can corrupt the text. And we have all of these three in our manuscript tradition. So that's the problem with the biblical transmission. Scholars may say, oh, but we can go still, but we know it, it suffered this corruption. Okay? So that's one thing to bear in mind. Next thing you look at, what does it say anyway? So it says, for example, if you look at the Bible, I'm going to give you two examples uh, that will suffice. The reason why we have a rainbow in the sky is because at one point mankind was doing evil things, right? And God saw the wickedness of man and he destroyed the man with the flood, saved but a few. Noah and his ark and that's it. And then the progeny of the people came and he made a covenant, a contract. And says from now on, God is not going to destroy the whole mankind like this wholesale. Um, and for this reason, he says, okay, I'm going to have a token of the covenant, a sign of the covenant. And this sign is I'm going to put a rainbow, a bow in the cloud. And whenever I am about to destroy mankind and I am looking at the cloud and I see the cloud and I see the rainbow, it will remind of the covenant. Now, um, tell me, if God puts a rainbow there, the purpose of the rainbow will be reminding who? Who will usually forget? Uh, the people, I guess. The people, right? Yeah. yeah. So we would expect the rainbow to be there for the people to remember of the covenant. Yeah. What if I showed you it's actually for God to remember? Okay? Now you will say, why does God remind him by a rainbow? Yeah? So this is in Genesis, Bible.com, so it's a biblical website, Genesis 9, 12 to 17. The rainbow that I have put in the sky will be my sign to you and to every living creature on earth. It will remind you that I will keep this promise forever. Good. It reminds you. When I send clouds over the earth and I rainbow appears in the sky, I will remember. My promise. God is saying, I will remember promise to you and all other living creatures. Never again I let sorry, will I let flood waters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the sky, I will always remember the promise that I have made to every living creature. The rainbow will be the sign of that solemn promise. Okay. God is saying the reason he put the rainbow that it will remind him when he looks at it. This does not go in sync with the concept of God that he is all knowledgeable, absolute, self-sufficient. So whoever wrote this didn't know much about God or it's a corrupted form of that message. So when we examine the Bible, this is example number one in the Old Testament. Another example is when mankind were gathering together in the land of Shinar in the east and they were building tall skyscrapers, very tall skyscrapers, with the hope, God says, what? Man is doing that, let us come down and confuse them. Because now nothing, look what God said, nothing will be impossible for them to do what they imagine to do. What the ancient Near Eastern people believed, we know from ancient Near Eastern texts that we've discovered in Mesopotamia, the belief they held is, if you build tall buildings and you go up to it, you can reach up to heaven and you can overthrow God. 
you can shoot an arrow and you can overthrow God because that's what they thought God was. So the picture that we have in the Bible again, that God is saying, what? Man is doing that and they speak the same language. Nothing will be impossible for them to do what they wanted to do. So let us go down and confuse them and scatter them. So God comes down and makes them bubble, whatever. And now that's why we are called Babylon and we speak in different languages. Because he was so concerned that he will be overthrown according to these um, ancient Near Eastern texts. In the Quran, the contrast is this. God says he created languages, nations and tribes in, in colors and so on, so that we recognize each other, not that we despise of each other. Sorry, what sorry? We recognize each other. Okay, okay. Ah, okay. Okay. So that we know each other. Okay. Imagine, everyone looked like yourself. Huh? Every man. I wouldn't even know who is who. Sergios and uh, also he's like Sergios. He's like, I wouldn't know. So the, the reason that we have, we have trouble identifying twins, yeah. right? And if everyone was the same, we'll be having a big trouble. Man and woman, everyone's the same. Whose wife is who? It's true. Right. So the difference that we have is to recognize each other. It's mercy from God so that we recognize not to despise of each other. The Bible that I was giving to show you the concept of God is opposite in which God is concerned that, you know, people speak the same language and he's so worried. That's the... He doesn't say that, but he says, what? Man is doing that? Nothing will be impossible for them to do. He comes down and confuses them. That part of that scripture, again, demonstrates it doesn't reflect who God really is. Or God creates, a fair example, and I'll close it there. Same Bible. He creates the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rests and he refreshes himself. Who needs refreshing? The one who gets tired. Yeah. Why would God need refreshing? It's a good question. Yeah. So if the Bible says God needs refreshing, that is not God. The one who is writing it, they don't even know who God is. In the Quran, God neither sleep nor slumber overtakes him. That's what the Quran says. He created the heavens and the earth in six days and fatigue, sleep, slumber, nothing touched him. Correcting these people, like, you know, your book says so, but that's wrong about me. I am not someone who needs refreshing because I get tired, because I am the necessary, you know, the reality, you know, possessor of knowledge and might and power. How can you even think about that? I can get tired. Yeah. So this is how we can examine scripture by looking at the concept of God within it. The other thing is, of course, looking at messages. Does it contradict in what it says? If it contradicts in his messages, then you know it cannot be, something's gone wrong with the scripture. That is what you'll find within the text of many scriptures. The Quran, on the other hand, challenges people to find a contradiction within it. It says, It's like this. Um, the ayah goes like this. Hmm? If this Quran was from God, yeah? they would find, if, if it wasn't not from God, they would find many contradictions within it. It's actually proactively challenging people to look into the Quranic message and see whether it has this inconsistencies within it. So the Quran, the Quran gives you these characteristics of God, the message that it gives, you would know that it has a coherent message throughout the Quran. So in that sense, it stands again, you know, from all of the rest of the scripture that this makes sense it prophecies? resonates so when the quran says when no the prophecies. <laughs> prophecies when the quran, the quran says for example and why does the bible the get prophecies wrong time, why does the bible get prophecies wrong Yehovah, Yehovah, can i ask you why does the bible get prophecies wrong the Bible is what is it getting wrong? And they come true time and time again. You what is it getting wrong? The Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. What is it getting wrong? Why was he born in Bethlehem? Micah 5 2 says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Do you believe in God? I'm um, not sure. Okay. Sergios, oh, you don't believe in God. Oh, to, okay. to give you an example of a prophecy, right? So we'd expect if God describes something in the future to come, yeah. it should come to pass, okay. right? If it doesn't come to pass, something else happens, you know that God was not knowledgeable enough in the future. So if we find the Bible makes prophecies like that and it doesn't come to pass, you will say what? Which one? Okay. Which one Jesus talks pass? about that this generation will not pass, but they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. 
That generation passed and they didn't see Jesus coming back in the clouds of heaven. So you know that scripture is not from God because that prophecy was failed. It didn't get fulfilled. You're taking that out of context. All Tell me the context. The, the context is the Messiah. Yeah. Okay. The Messiah of Israel. Yeah. The, the, he's called the God of Israel. And, and in the Quran, they're called the Israel. The, no, no, the Israelites. talk about that prophecy. Okay. This generation, when he gives all these signs, what's going to happen? The Jews in 1948, they moved back to Israel. So this generation that sees Jerusalem taken, that's 1967. Now a generation in the Bible, maximum 80 years. Because in Psalm 90, Dawood didn't write that one, Musa. Musa wrote that one. You have three score years and 10, which is 70 plus 10. Maximum 80 years. So maximum from 1967 when the Jews got got control of Jerusalem. That's the context. That generation will see the end of everything. The son of man coming. The son of David, the son of Dawood. Then, so what's that? 67, 40, that's 2047. So according to that, it would appear, it could be 120, but it's probably 80. So that's the context. When Jesus spoke these words, okay, this so generation... Um, excuse me, I heard you and I didn't interrupt you. So show me the same kind of civility. Thank you. So when Christ was speaking, this generation, he didn't mean the generation in 1980s. He didn't mean the, the, the generation X or the TikTok generation. Uh, Sergio, did I interrupt him when he was speaking? Yeah, but you're taking it out of context. Why, why is this that's gentleman interrupting when, when, when he's... Corner. So that's a heckler. It's not Islam corner. So, Islam. so it's a heckling. It's called, so that's it's, not called, no, it's called discussion. It's a heckling. Okay, Sergius. So we will ignore the hecklers. I'm going to go direct to the text. So when Christ is saying this generation should not pass, this generation, he's referring to the generations which is within him. He didn't say, oh, this generation in 1983, was he? He wasn't. Uh, exactly. Oh, no, no, you, you, but, you look, look, it, look, look here. He's putting, look at it. Putting it out of the whole Truly, I tell you, this generation will generation? certainly not pass away until all these yeah, things have happened. So, before. when he's speaking to them about this generation, any sensible reader, Honest whether you're a lay person reader. or a scholar, you would know. Take the reference, Matthew 24 34. I mean, it is this what Jesus said. That's the text, right? Okay, okay. 24, yeah. 20, they said, when are you coming back? Um, Matthew Sirkus, 24, 25, he gave, I, will I think, I think we can ignore, yeah, we can yeah, ignore the heckler, right? Okay. Yeah, the Here, text, the when Christ is saying, he doesn't say, oh, in the future there will be a generation and you'll do this maths and you'll make up this prophecy. No, he's simply saying, you, this generation, this generation will not pass until you see me coming back in the clouds in heaven. Guess what? 2,000 years have almost gone. This generation pass, and the next generation, and the next generation, many generations pass, so it's a failed prophecy. Right, so when we're now coming back, so when we're coming back now about the concept of how do we ascertain, authenticate and validate a scripture, we look at, we look at the truthfulness of his, and accuracy of his message. Truthfulness and accuracy of his message. What if this book contains historical errors? You would say, God is not the one who will make Mistakes because he knows the history just like he knows the future. Prophecies keep coming wrong, he's ignorant of the future. Historical thing gets it right, he's unaware of the past, he's not all knowledgeable. So when the Bible makes the mistakes of the history, one example is about the Pharaohs. At the time of Moses, um, at the time of Moses and Joseph, these two prophets, right? We know from Egyptian history, roughly around this time, what they were called in their particular title. You know when we say a king, king is a title of someone's authority in being in charge, right? You can call that an Amir or a president, what different localities have different concepts. They had the pharaohs at that time, and the pharaoh had specific titles and conventions of titles. At the time of Moses and at the time of Joseph, from our historical record, if we were to align these people from the historical time frame, they didn't have the same time table. The monarchs or the, the people in authority in charge at the time of Joseph the prophet, peace be upon him, they were called kings. They were not called pharaohs. At the time of Moses, it was called pharaoh. Bible doesn't make that distinction. It called both of them pharaohs. Now we know it's wrong historically. Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? 
He doesn't even know. Even today, he doesn't even know. So guess what? The Quran, the Quran, Quran distinguishes this and says, addresses the, the man in charge, the authority in charge, as the king at the time of Joseph, peace be upon him, and Fir'aun or Pharaoh at the time of Moses. So now, even looking at historically, you need to understand how does the Quran get this right when the Bible gets it wrong? You know, some people say, oh, the Quran copied from the Bible. Why is the Quran not copying their mistakes? But it's giving you something that we didn't know until the hieroglyphics were discovered. And hieroglyphics were un, you know, what's it called, unpacked. Now we know because the hieroglyphics tells us all these stories. So the criteria we are using, concept of God, message contents, the accuracy of his message. Accuracy, accuracy. You'll find when you talked about, what about the Bible? I'm afraid it's not my liking or disliking. The Bible fails on that count, okay? The Quran, on the other hand, challenges people to show otherwise. So this is the thing, Sir Kios, you will be you, your next thing to do, perhaps. Let's challenge the Quran. Let's put the Quran into text. As a Muslim, I will say yes. Quran is free from errors, discrepancies, inconsistencies, contradictions. Quran is free from all of that. The Quran gives us, in fact, falsification tests to falsify it. So you can take that and say, let me test it. This is the next step that you can take. If it does fulfill all the criteria and withstands the scrutiny, then you would know the Quran is a revelation from the all knowledgeable, all wise, almighty. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. Pleasure speaking to you. Uh, me too. Okay. You take care. Um, read the Quran. If you haven't got a copy, if you go this way, there are people with a table on them. Three copies of the Quran. It's all. Oh, there you go. Look. This is for you. A copy. Yeah. Um, read the Quran read, with an open mind. Give the Bible, that will take you five hours. Give the Bible a read, take you 50. And you'll find a third of it is prophecy comes true. I challenge you to read that and find one prophecy that comes true. So read it. I've read okay, the Quran. Okay. Shall I give you a prophecy for you to reflect on? Okay, I'll show you where it is. Uh, the weather's going to be good. Because he's trying to, he's trying to give me a prophecy which I wanted to make you read and find out. <laughs> Chapter 30 of the Quran is this. Now, here, so you know that this is something that it's the riskiest prophecy anyone can make, riskiest. Why I say that riskiest? This is called Surah Al-Rum, okay, They're about the Romans, right? About the Romans, Alif Lam Mim, right? The Byzantines, the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, but they will, after the defeat, will what overcome. does it say overcome, no? overcome i mean they will be victorious again within three to nine years be the isin in arabic to allah belongs the command uh, before and after and that day the believers will rejoice right here when the quran is revealed it's tell it's telling the author of the quran is telling them look the byzantines the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, right? It's a historical reality. People know about it. People hear about it. The Persians came, right, and defeated them. But the Quran says, but hang on, they will overcome them. They will be victorious again within Bid'a'i Sinin. It's an Arabic term which means between three to nine years. Now, if you understand the historical context of the war that happened between the Persians and the Romans, okay, Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. These are two superpowers. The way they're happening, once you destroy one, what gives you the certain to say, you know what, between three and nine years, you will defeat them again. How do you even know that? Because you, look, has, has Russia sprung back again to be the superpower it was before? Once it got dismantled, that's it. No one can say, oh, you know what, Russia will come become a USSR and becomes the contending superpower with USA. You can't do that. This happened and Muslim rejoiced on that day. How can you do that unless you have the knowledge of the unseen of the future? 
So this is one of the riskiest prophecies. What if it didn't happen? The, the Quran would have been falsified. The Prophet would have been said, okay, you don't even know what you're talking about. So these kind of prophecies, which was not necessary to make, no one asked him to say, okay, give me a prophecy like this. The Quran is giving that information by its own accord and telling you this is what's going to happen. So imagine you, if, you, if you're an imposter, you, you fake to be a prophet and you know your limitation because you don't know everything. And somebody asked, tell me, how do I solve the equations for um, general theory of relativity? But what if, like, this is a question, wouldn't the Quran, like, maybe, like, but the Quran was written but, but by one person, right? So I don't know how the Quran... Quran revealed by God to the Prophet. Okay, okay. Yeah, to the, same, read or write, to the Prophet. He, had people he, was a, he was a literate. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, like, can it be, like, for example, like, like supposing, like, and they only keep the, the prophecies that they got right? Ah, uh, that is exactly the point I made earlier. Okay. How do we know the text that we have today? Yeah, yeah. is transmitted to us without any change. So you can, you can go and look at the transmission history. Okay. The Quran has a dual transmission history unlike many of the other scriptures. And that transmission history, one enriches and emboldens and strengthens the other. One is the textual transmission by writing manuscripts and the other one is memorization. The whole book was memorized and transmitted memorized word for word, letter for letter, sound for sound, chapter by chapter, line by line. This is how it was. It was also written down and transmitted through manuscripts. So you can find in Birmingham, oh not in Birmingham, um, where is it? The Birmingham manuscript kept. Birmingham University, where is it kept? A manuscript, three of, you know, a few pages of the Quran, which is very close to the time of the companions of the Prophet And you can see how congruous and similar or same it is okay. yeah orthographical i think there might be one which is tawin and tua on orthographical differences there but literally otherwise it's identical almost so this is how the transmission of the text is demonstrated from the manuscript tradition the biblical transmission of the manuscript we talked about earlier how different it is so how do we know this is exactly what it was given to the prophet from god we know that from looking at the manuscripts and looking at the traces of the transmission through memorization. The Quran is being memorized today by hundreds and thousands of people who are even not Arabs. They don't even know how to speak Arabic and yet they memorize the whole of the book. Let's look at it. Whole of the book they memorized it. Word for word, letter for letter in this sequence. This has been a practice yesterday, the day before, the month before, the year before, the decade before, the, 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 the you know, hundred years before and so on. Centuries of practice of Quran memorization. So in this sense, you can be sure that the Quran, the text that we have, is the text that what the Prophet left behind. Thank you very much. Okay. You take care. Very interesting to hear. Okay. Nice to you. You take care. Thank you. Brother, assalamu alaikum. I just want to tell you, I came all the way from Kuwait to tell you I love you for the sake of Allah. Uh, me too. Wallah 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 May Allah bless you, brothers. And I learned from you a lot, alhamdulillah. Uh, we learn from each other. Barakallah. Because I, I need to learn patience from you, Allah. <laughs> I, need, I need more patience than Allah that bless I have. Allah bless you, Habibi. Allah bless you. 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 Allah you. Allah bless you. Allah bless yeah. So, uh, you want to take them more minutes? Yeah, I've already won. I lost my mic in the oh, so, uh, No, not yet. Yeah. 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 It's a nice to meet you, bro.